Greetings, Langarinos. I'm Peter. Hello. And we're back still learning Ganonga language, also called Kumbukota, from Solomon Islands. Uh, and we're going to start by looking a little bit at the phoneme inventory of the language. How do you even describe something like this? Well, Tyler has a whiteboard up, and he's going to show you a little bit about how we might approach it. Right. Now, Peter and I are in the situation where we haven't actually heard a speaker of the language. We're just basing our understanding of the language and the analysis of it on our text collection that you've been seeing us work on. But it uses the same alphabet that English uses, and it looks like we have five vowels in Ranonga. I'm just going to do the full screen here for the vowels. E, U are high vowels. They have, we just kind of have to assume they have the usual values. E, O are with the mouth slightly more open. We call them mid vowels. And we have A at the bottom. So Peter, what do you think? Is it likely there are any other vowel phonemes besides this? I think it's uh, unlikely. And while it is true that Tyler and I haven't heard a speaker of the language, uh, I have heard speakers of closely related languages, so I have an idea about what the phonemes might sound like, or what how the things that are represented called a grapheme, what they might actually sound like. Grapheme being the written mark. Uh, so. And they may have diff diphthongs in the language. So that's a diphthong is kind of like uh, two vowels that count as one. Yeah, in the, in the space of one syllable. You could have, English has a lot of those, A, I, and so on. We have one starting point. Your jaw or your tongue is going to move over the course of, the, of saying that vowel sound. You mentioned the other, so this vertical dimension in the chart is jaw height. Ah is at the bottom. That's where your jaw is the lowest. The left side there, E, that's where your tongue is tending forward. And for U, O, it's tending, it's being pulled back. Another worthwhile thing to do would be to look at which sequences occur. We get lots of instances of ia. I don't think that's a diphthong. I think that's two syllables. We have ua and so on. But for today, let's just survey the most elementary level here, the single phonemes. Maybe, can you say a word about what a phoneme is, Peter? So a phoneme, <clears throat> it's important, even though we're using spelling to base our sound analysis on our analysis of sounds a phoneme is not necessarily the same thing as a written letter a phoneme is it's a little bit abstract but one of the best ways to think about it is that it's a representation in the mind of the speaker or it could be the signer my understanding is that there can be potentially phones in uh sign languages in any case we're not dealing with a sign language so we'll focus on uh spoken phonology a phoneme is like the mental target. It's the representation. So you might think that there's a sound, let's call it P in English, and that P has a certain sound. But as you start to carefully measure the phonetic realities of P in different environments, in different words, you'll see that P actually has a couple different surface forms, a couple different phonetic realizations, but it all resolves to the same symbol in the mind, the same representation. This mental target, to quote Sapir, is what we call a phoneme. So this is what we're looking for in Ganonga, and it may be, for example, Tyler has written a B on there with a little M before it. Mm -hmm. We think because it's oceanic and it's Western Oceanic, and it's particularly in the New Georgia subgroup, like Roviana, we suspect that all the voiced stop sounds will be pre-nasalized. So the B will have, we're writing a little M before it. If I put it between two vowels, it would sound like amba. Mm -hmm. Now this B may have different realizations in different positions, right? I'd be willing to bet that the M is more pronounced when the B is in between vowels than when it's at the beginning of a word, which makes sense for phonetic reasons. We don't necessarily know all that stuff though, what we we can use what we know about related languages and what we know from the writing to speculate that this are the number of phonemes. And well, what they are. It's just our best guess. We don't really know what's going on with the glottal stop, if that's real or not. Yeah. Uh, 
putting it in a different color because it's more hypothetical, but we do have some evidence that points toward it. Yeah, we have some evidence. So let's let's review the blue and red first, and then let's talk about the green. I have a few thoughts on whether it's even phonemic. Even if it exists, it might not be a phoneme, but that's what we'll talk about after we discuss the less contentious stuff. Yeah, indeed. So in this chart, I use the height dimension, well, more or less. Height dimension is a bit arbitrary, but at the top of the chart, there are sounds where we have complete occlusion or closure somewhere of the oral passage, but to cut up. At some point, air, the airstream is being cut off, some point in the, in the articulatory apparatus, the mouth and what's below the mouth. And the going left to right, that dimension, <laughs> whatever it may be called, that represents how far inward and how far outward. So P, P, B, V, those are made at the far extremity, furthest from the lungs up at the front of the mouth. And as we go rightward, we're coming inward into the, into the body. So in that order, those are our voiceless stops. And then the second row, the nja, we didn't, if we saw it in the very first text, it was only a couple instances near the end. It seems to be the rarest of these phonemes in the second row, but that's a pre-nasalized voiced palatal stop is my understanding. Our evidence for that is in the, well, aside from, I had kind of predicted it, that it would be this way when we get the letter J. And then when we saw a, thank you. When we saw the rendering in English, was it Rinjong Bangara? No, or some other place. But they used NJ for that single letter in Hanonga. That sealed the deal for me, that it's Nja. That's what they put it in the English to give us the hint, right? Sometimes the spellings for the two languages diverge. And that was one very important clue. I'm just going to do a search for NJ and I'll find it. All right. Then in the red group, first row, voice fricatives, we think. And then S stands on its own as the only voiceless fricative phoneme. Yeah, that word was Rinjong Bangara. That was where we saw. It's R I J O at the beginning for Ganonga. And in English, R I N J O. Tyler, we've seen no H at all. Sounds right to me. Now I'm thinking of it, and I can't think of an H we've seen. I'm doing a search. It's beautiful in the spreadsheet. And you get it, it just lights up the English column. There were a couple cells in the Ranonga that are highlighted to highlighted or highlight. What do you feel? Mm. <laughs> okay, there was one. Hold on. Ah, I keep sliding past it. All right, text one, the tenth paragraph. It finds an H. Oh, in the word hmm, H M. Hmm. There's your H. <laughs> it's interesting. There's no H. Ruruhu. Okay. In this name, in this text, we get H. We needed to. I need this. Is based on the charting I did really, really early on, not on stream, but just for my own thinking about the language. H is glottal, just like the glottal stop, and it's voiceless. I'm going to put it in that position in the chart. So as you're studying a language or capital L language, charting sounds or phonemes out in this way could be really helpful. I find it really interesting sort of identifying gaps and thinking about what might have happened through time. For instance, early on, I thought, well, we have we're, we're lacking a palatal stop here and s is isolated so maybe there was a phoneme ch in the distant past that over time migrated to an s other languages have made such a change but i don't really think so now i'm glad we're looking at this today because we now added a, a member I now ruru who could be a non hanonga name i think that h probably did go to zero historically and then it was reintroduced in loan words like ruruhu which is probably a loan word just guessing because there's very little h yeah suspiciously little i'm gonna just do it in green also because it's sort of marginal to us not all phonemes are well how to, how to say it they're not all equal they're not all equally privileged or equally established in the language some phonemes are marginal and some are central 
sort of peripheral. For example, in English, you could say that there's a marginal TS phoneme I or even it. sequence, which isn't found in any native words. And typically native speakers of English won't pronounce foreign words correctly, but some people will that have well, So for example- You mean initial? Yeah, so tsunami. I just said an S there, but you may find certain people that speak English that will actually pronounce it tsunami with a little T at the beginning. So that's a kind of an example, although because TS is more challenging to articulate. Is there any other good examples of phonemes we don't have in English that we might get in a loan word? Ah, loch is a famous one. If people really say it, yeah. So he yeah, says yeah. Lock and lock. Which is like right. it's Loch Ness. Uh, people who do genre with a nasal vowel. I don't, I don't know if anyone does in English. Genre? <laughs> genre. Genre. <laughs> or a name like Jean and so on. Yeah, if you names are a really likely place for those things to creep in because you got to say people's names as they are or try to. Now, on so real quick, if it's at the end of the syllable or in the middle of a word like pizza, no problem at all. It's only the word onset that poses challenges, it seems, for English in right. Chinese. That is the one type of cluster that does exist. Well, yeah, so it's better, probably better viewed in English when you see it as a sequence than a phoneme, but just the kind of way a sound could creep in uh, is mm -hmm. also an example. Now, H is a pretty common sound in languages. Across languages, yeah. Yeah, so it's not that crazy to borrow it in. So uh, it would be less likely to borrow in. So in English, we're unlikely to borrow in Oh, I don't know. A, a retroflex sound. Or less, so a retroflex sound would be like ala, ala, ata. Yeah. We're less likely to borrow those in um, because we have nothing else really like it. I understand that the English R can be made retroflex, but it's not, not retroflex right. the way I'm meaning right here. As a unit, right? When we say tree, there is retroflexion happening. Shroom. So what would be interesting is to see if um we, anyways let's let's talk about the basics of the blue and red and then i'll discuss more my thoughts on the glottal stop in green good let me i'm feeling the need to also add another notation for how it's spelled in our documents our orthography exactly what is our orthography by the way i was thinking more about what makes a link or a historical linguist different from philologists philologists as I understand it, only work with texts. Historical linguists are not so constrained. So to the right, for instance, to the right of the gamma letter, I put a G, that's how our text spell it. And above it, Q is for the pre-nasalized unga sound. And the paddle nasal is written as a sequence of NY. That's right, thank you. Yeah, let me get my little things out of the way. This one is underlined N in our text, and this NY. And I think, oh, and this one is dash, we think. Yeah, so what we've actually seen is the dash. We haven't actually seen the glottal stop. It's hard to see one. Now, Tyler, what makes you think that glottal stop is what the dash represents? Well, I think it's really just kind of a gut thing in the first level. But let me offer support. I suppose that our scribe, the person who has put who's chosen the letters for our text, has some exposure to English. And our glottal stop in English, when it's not a phoneme, a phoneme of T, it's pretty hard to find. It's either beginning as taking the place of the zero onset. So Amber, if I'm calling you <laughs> and that's your name, it's hard to really be, it's hard to get that vowel going without some consonant onset there. Mm -hmm. So we put in the glottal stop there. So that means the vocal folds are brought together and released again, amber. Or we get it as variant of T in a word like button, I do. Other dialects of English do it more broadly for T. But the other place we'll get it is an uh-oh. And I think the most common spelling for that is U-H dash O-H. Not a slam dunk, but that's one line of support, I think. So spelling is what motivates your guess at Glottal Stop there. I mean, the, the fact is, glottal stop was not a phoneme of Latin, so Latin, the Latin alphabet doesn't have a 
an unambiguous letter shape for it the way it does for a T or a P. Now in Hawaiian, they have that okina we mentioned yesterday, last time, apostrophe-like letter. I, do. I don't know, that's we not all the apostrophe logically- contractions in Ganonga. So we've been representing apostrophe with a capital C in our in our own transcription, and we hypothesize that it doesn't represent a glottal stop; it represents a contraction. That's now, because you can think like n apostrophe vowel, z apostrophe vowel, it's possible to do a glottal stop there. That seems unlikely. I agree with Tyler that the most likely sound for the um, dash in our book is glottal stop, but I potentially agree for different reasons. I bet they're the same reasons, just Tyler hasn't got there yet. Um, which is, first of all, um, if it was one of the phonemes that they already are representing with a letter, they would use that letter. So we don't think it's like K or T or something like that. It's something that's not typically coming. It's something rare. For me, what is conspicuous is about it is that it seems to be separating sequences of vowels. So there are two main, um, let's say, like potential That's origins it. of this glottal stop. And one would be a historical origin. All right. So is it was it secretly a coda that only appears when something is inserted after it? Right. Was it uh, an unpronounced thing? Well, we've seen that Ganonga has echo vowels meaning if something ends in a word final consonant, they will insert another vowel afterwards. So it's weird that they have this one exception where they delete the coda unless something vowel is added. So why would something like lea'i uh, pique my interest there? Well, it seems to me uh, that Ganonga goes out of its way to avoid too many sequences of vowels as we've already seen deletion of some vowels in the object agreements to prevent too many sequences of vowels. So if it's unavoidable to have too many sequences of vowels, um, something might get inserted and a glottal stop's a great solution and there is precedent for it in Austronesian. So my understanding is that Tagalog actually inserts a non-phonemic glottal stop in between sequences of vowels. So for example, the word for eat should come from Proto-Austronesian Khan or Khan or something like that. Khan, I believe, because we Rani in Ganoga, so that's from Khani. Right. Khan Makan in Indonesian. Uh, uh, the Khan. Ai in Hawaiian. <clears throat> and the Hawaiian, that is a glottal stop at the beginning that came from the K. And okay. N seemed to delete a lot of times between A and I. N and L went weird ways there where in Polynesian. And I'm not an expert in that, but just I've noticed it. So that is indeed an actual cognate. But my understanding of the Tagalog word is something like ka'an, but the glottal stop is not mm. semic. It's just separating uh, what would be a sequence of ah and schwa. So, and and and, and, and if I, we can check the Tagalog once we're out of the shares. Once we go to Google, we can check and confirm. But I do know that there is, I think it's called vowel hiatus. They're avoiding vowel mm -hmm. hiatus. So you, you want to not have too many vowels in a row. And so one of the things that they might do is insert a glottal stop. And that's why I am really sympathetic to the idea or really open to the idea that the dash might be meaning glottal stop, but it might not be a phony. So we have it there in green. We have H there in green because we did see it in Ruruhu, Ruruhu, but I wonder if that's a loan word. And particularly because we've only seen it used as a name. So we saw in the Roviana Dictionary, it has a meaning of a certain type of crab. That's right, that hermit crab. I, I forgot about that. It's a crab that, crab that sheds its shell or whatever, but maybe not exactly a hermit crab. Hermitoid. Yeah, something like this. So um, it's interesting. It's the second name of a guy. And so we're getting... Mm -hmm. Make these stories for places that we'll see something called one thing in Ganonga, and then the English translation will be a different word for it. So we know or... loan words, and Ruruhu seems like a likely loan word. Right. There's also the fact that initial R seems rare in Ganonga words. So that and the H both point to a non-Ganonga origin of the name. As we looked in the Austronesian Comparative Dictionary, 
Initial R was rare in Oceanic and Proto-Oceanic. Not so, the only skin. Ganonga is certainly an Austronesian language and is certainly Oceanic. But you got to understand that one of the big influences right near it is this island Vela La Vela. And they have their own language and it is a non-Austronesian language. And to the south a little bit, right there in the New Georgia Archipelago on Rendova, they have two languages and one is Austronesian and one is non-Austronesian. And uh, it would seem that there, it is likely that there were people living in New Georgia before the Austronesians came 3,500 years ago. Um, although in the specific case of the New Georgia archipelago, the archaeology is not as clear as for other places in the Solomon Islands, meaning there's not really good evidence that there were non-Austronesians there before the Austronesians. Um, but it is likely. It, it's just not... It's an absence of evidence type thing. It is still likely that there were already people there. And so... I guess what I'm saying is the Austronesians have been there for thousands of years, but they had mixed with these other communities and there's a lot of language shift going on and people who spoke non-Austronesian languages switching to Austronesian languages and things like this. And so when we're looking at good retentions, like that's what we're looking for when we're looking for historical phonology. We're not really looking for what the loan words do. And it's likely there are a lot of loan words in the language. We've already observed some historical splits that are a little bit... Um, interesting and we have some examples of words we think like rane we think is probably a loan word from another austronesian language so do you want to peter do you want to say more about consonants i'd like to do one more chart yeah let's keep going my consonants yes all right then i will leave it up otherwise i would erase it now oh i thought you said you wanted to show me something with another chart and consonants yeah another chart yeah yeah by keep going, I'm not sure if you mean go more, keep going about consonants or look at another. Show me the next chart. I shall. All right. It's really simple, but I suspect most viewers won't have seen this type of thing. Some viewers may not. I'm going to clear all. And I'm just going to write two letters in this chart, but I think they're important ones. So the first set of sounds we have, we observed, E, U, A, O, A, those are our vowels. That's what V represents fits in the same space, by the way. And that second chart that I just erased, that was our consonants. But this is an important representation of what we think all the Nunga syllables are like. Yeah. We do get in our text a, a couple instances where you have two consonants following a vowel, but I'm so committed to this analysis that I think we those need to be explained away, like we saw yesterday. I agree. So. Um, the only exception might be that there might be contractions, but they aren't writing it that way. So there may be, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So what Tyler is talking about is the shape of syllables. Now, languages actually restrict what can, how, how much stuff can be in one syllable. Particularly, languages are more restrictive about coda environments. So a coda is what comes after the vowel in a syllable, and an onset is what comes before. So the onset being consonants, the coda being consonants. In Ganonga, we've seen no evidence that a coda can be occupied by a consonant or anything for that matter. And so we propose that there are these words that underlyingly have a word final uh, consonant, which would be a coda, except that a vowel becomes inserted afterwards, so it becomes an onset. Yeah, I should, let me give an example here while you're talking. In English, we have a very permissive syllable, and many things can happen, but not everything, right? And we find, again, that the coda is more restrictive than the onset. More stuff can happen in the coda than the onset. For example, you can have str for strike in an onset, mm -hmm. but you couldn't have... Oh, you can get RTS. You can get the reverse, so starts. All yeah. right, so that wasn't a good example. There are good examples, though. Tyler, can you think of one off the top of your head? I'm sorry, we're, we're looking for examples of what now? Uh, something that's allowed in an onset, but not allowed in a coda in English. Well, the, the sound H is such a case. Perfect example, yeah. Although in that case, we have to balance with engma is allowed in codas, but not onsets yeah. in English. And, okay, here's, the here's something. The sequence theta R, like in three, yes. can't end 
people with thr. But you could end it with the reverse r r t h. Like so, fourth, yeah. So one of the things that we've got to what Tyler really did on the consonant screen was he arranged them in order of this concept called sonority. So the least sonorous sounds versus the most sonorous consonants. And the most sonorous thing is a vowel. Sonorous means singable, basically. But there's yeah. this concept in phonology where certain sounds have a higher sonority vowel value. So there, there's all these implications. Like only certain things of certain sonority can be a nucleus to an onset. In Ganonga, or nucleus to a syllable. In Ganonga, it appears that only vowels can occupy the nucleus of a syllable. The nucleus is what we're representing with V now. In English, this isn't true. Something like R or L or even M and N can occupy mm -hmm. it because bottom button bottle butter but nothing the, syllable, the weak syllable in each of the cases just has a consonant taking up that position nothing less sonorous than a nasal can be a nucleus to a syllable in english though yes. though there are languages that allow other things to be yes. and there's most languages are more restrictive so um that's true What's going on with the three and worth examples is that we propose that the most sonorous stuff needs to be in the middle. So mm. if we look at theta and R as an onset and we want to know if it's permissible in the syllable, we have to reverse the order because R is much more sonorous than theta. So it should be closer to the center. Now, what would be interesting is we could get R theta in the, in the onset, but not get theta R in the coda. But we can't get either in English. That's right. So English has a very permissive onset in coda, whereas um, the syllable shape, what we're describing as onsets and coda conditions, this is all generally called the shape of the syllable. Mm -hmm. This is very restrictive in Ganonga. Now, you might say, oh, well, they allow a nasal to precede a stop, right? Well, this is phonemic. It's not viewed as a, a sequence right. That's right. phonologically. It is a sequence phonetically. So phonetically refers to like the linguistic reality or the acoustic reality. Phonological is like the psychological system of sounds in the speaker's or signer's mind. Let's talk about echo vowel and then go back to the texts. So maybe Mbangara is not such a case, but I think Mbangara being the word for chief, Nguru is our word for leaf. That might be a better instance of this echo vowel phenomenon we just mentioned briefly. What's going on? Maybe, do you want a verb instead that does this? Or will these examples do? Um, well, we can't be for sure, but I think the verb parogo is our best example of echo voweling. That means to like okay. cook something on a fire or whatever. We may have a better one in harata and haratia. Yeah, that's my favorite example to use in Romanian. Okay. I'm going to put that up top then. Get rid of this. That is the verb to bite or nip at something. And what, what I'm doing is I'm putting the orthography, the spelling on the left, and our phonemic representation with fancy symbols on the right. So what's an echo vowel, Peter? So in the case of garata, remember it's a gamma, which I am saying with a more English style G, but just to make it I'm just making the sound more clear on my microphone. If I wanted to say it more correctly, it would be something like rarata, probably. Uh, and I'm not as good at stress. So where the stress should be, if I were to go to Ganonga, that would be pretty much the first thing I would be investigating mm. is where should stress be. And I would check a bunch of words with echo vowels, proposedly, and without. What's happening in this word is, how do we know it's an echo vowel? Well, one of the things we notice is that when Garata is followed by a object agreement, the final a ah immediately disappears. And we haven't seen it fully fleshed out um, with Ganonga, but I have seen this fleshed out with Roviana, and I suspect that this echo vowel feature, even if it's not active today, which I bet that it is, but we can't know, was shared long before Roviana and Ganonga were separate languages, probably before they their shared common ancestor. This probably goes back to maybe Western Oceanic or something. Within Oceanic, we see this conspiracy. Now you think I'm saying conspiracy willy-nilly. I am not. Conspiracy is a technical term in phonology. 
coming from yeah, Tyler, Peter, my shared teacher, yes. Hadj Ross. Who coined the I'm term. sure you, Peter, is never willy or nilly. <laughs> Zero nilliness. Uh, no, there's no name that rhymes with serious, but I'd be serious whatever serious willy or is or whatever successfully derailed i want to i want to bring up a quick point before you go on there how could we see if the echo vowel thing is still conspiracy is still a thing in the language well suppose that you went by pete maybe or perhaps a two-syllable name would be better a name like robert the question is if we went to a non uh, to a monolingual anonga speaker someone who never learned english and tried to get them to say a name like robert how would it come out they would hear the T, I presume. Would they do something like robata? That would be evidence, I think. My guess would be it'd be robati. Robati. But I, I don't know. Not an echo vowel. If they did it as a bata, so that it, vowel copy, that would be the echo vowel. That we're I think the, the prohibition on codas is still active, but the idea of echo vowel might not be active anymore, and they might just use E. No, there's still echo vowel -y stuff. So I'm taking this all from Roviana and guessing similar stuff is happening in Gononga, and I can't know for sure. But when I think of the word school is sikulu, sikulu, S-I-K-U-L-U. So that's an echo vowel because it's an English loan word. By the way, loan words are some of the best ways to learn about phonological principles in a language, how they, what they can accept and what they can't. It shows you constraints really cool or really clearly. But my understanding of the that the word Christmas, Christmas and Roviana is Kirisi Masi. But it might be that Kirisi Masa is a forbidden echo vowel, and that's it. I mean, there it could be much more complex than I think. But just to say there's Sikulu, so there's some evidence of echo voweling and some evidence of a new one, E. So I don't know what it would be, but I would bet that the name Robert will not be able to be ended in a T, nor will it have RT in the coda. Right, right. That probably skipped. Right, so I, I, I think we still haven't really made clear what we mean by the echo vowel. Our view, because we get a form Garatia, he bit it or something, we suppose that the root of this verb is just up to the T. And if you have an Ia, it'll attach right onto the T. And if you don't have any suffix there, T still wants to be pronounced, but it can't end a word because CV. This is the constraint. Every syllable has to have these two. Well, it needs the vowel and can have a consonant. Really, it should be like this. So they could do it as rara or rarata, but they couldn't say rarat the way we can. Right. So what happens is, is they actually echo. If you'll do, draw a little, oh, you can't draw right now. Let me see if I can annotate. Uh, I'm just getting my second cup of draw. I'm going to put a little. So it's this a ah vowel, whoop, copies right over there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And that That is what I believe is going on. That's why I call it an echo vowel. Why do we not just say everything ends in a? Ah? Well, we have parogol, which we saw, saw short. That's, yeah, let me add that too. Parogia. And can you do the same thing for enguru? If that's least... what's happening with enguru, yeah. But, um, I'm, I, I feel we have good evidence that it's happening with the... With verbs, yeah. Verbs? Variation. Probably this is happening with nouns, too. Now, I'm tempted to think bangara is a real three-syllable word. Uh -huh. uh, due to personal contact with Pete Lincoln, my friend. Uh, and if you are into oceanic linguistics, Pete Lincoln is a... People who are into it know who he is. He doesn't have a ton of publications, but he's passionate about the scene. Um and has certainly taught me a lot and he has told me that on bougainville there is a like big volcano uh and in rhodocus rhodocus is interesting it's either the language with the least consonants in the world or one of the least consonants mm. um and so there's some version of bangara is the name for the big volcano on the biggest island on Bougainville is the biggest island in the geographic Solomon Islands, but Bougainville belongs to Papua New Guinea. So Bougainville is close to Western Western Solomons is the province in Solomon Islands that's that's closest to Bougainville. So it, undoubtedly, they've had some influence on each other before political lines were drawn. And I believe that Bangara is a three-syllable word in the languages around the big volcano in Bougainville. Let's get back to the text collection now, though. Do some more work. 
Uh, I want to finish saying about the Oceanic Conspiracy. Now, By all means. this is something that big linguistics doesn't want you to know about. That's why Tyler's fighting tooth and nail to keep me from telling you about the Oceanic Conspiracy. <laughs> so it's not true. Big linguistics isn't blocking you from knowing about it. Conspiracy is a term, as I said, coined by Hadge Ross originally, who was a teacher to both Tyler and myself. Um, if generally, if you find a fun word in formal linguistics, Hadge <laughs> named that, generally speaking. So pied piping, sluicing, uh, freezes, That's right. islands. So islands is a syntax thing. But of course, I've tried desperately to investigate islands in Roviana. And I would like to do more work on islands in general in Oceania so that I could write the paper Islands on Islands. But We're talking, yeah, syntactic islands on geographic islands. Yeah. Don't worry about what a syntax island is. If you really want to know, shoot us a message. I'll write, I'll make a whole podcast, a whole video, a TikTok, whatever you want. I'll do it on islands. <laughs> All right. So what is the Oceanic Conspiracy? Well, it's like this. Proto-Oceanic seemed to prefer two-syllable words generally that ended in a so this goes back to the PMP preferred word shape, proto malayo polynesian preferred word shape. So there were a lot of two-syllable words that ended with a final consonant in Oceanic. That trend didn't hold up with the modern 450 Oceanic languages. And there were generally two solutions. One solution, which we see in the, for example, in Hawaiian and Polynesian languages, generally in Central Pacific languages, is that you can delete the final consonant. So that's C3, as Tyler has uh, represented on the board. The other solution was to insert a vowel after C3. Now, we say this is a conspiracy because we have two different, an insertion and a deletion, and they're both acting to avoid a certain mm -hmm. thing, which is yeah. a final consonant, right? There is, the Micronesian languages are famous for having final consonants, by the way, but if you look, a lot of those are one-syllable words. And it seems that some of the consonants at least came from deleting one of the syllables so like you get a situation where there might have been cvc uh or cvcv i mean they might have deleted the final consonant and then deleted the vowel and then wound up that way and there's also a couple other little things micronesian that i'm talking about micronesian is not it's a geographic area and there are languages in micronesia that are not oceanic such as palau and chamorro and there is yap Yap probably has some of the most fascinating phonology of any oceanic languages, and Yap represents a primary branch of oceanic, meaning that it is the only extant member of its prime of its split of oceanic. Mm -hmm. Other than those three, the rest of the languages, not all the languages in Micronesia, because there's Polynesian back migrators, so pol so-called Polynesian outliers. After Polynesian languages started really spreading all over the Pacific, some of them came back west and north, and, and they came back into Micronesia too. I'm talking about the Micronesian languages with as a subgroup within Oceanic. And um, those ones are the ones where you find codas and things like that. Um, but as a rule, you're finding this situation where a lot of these Proto-Oceanic uh, CV, CVC words either delete the final syllable uh, consonant or insert a vowel afterwards. So we'd call this a conspiracy. We have two different things acting on it to avoid a certain thing. So it's kind of neat. If you were into phonology, I would recommend that you approach this sort of problem with what we call an optimality theory solution, although there is other great solutions as well. All right, that is the oceanic conspiracy. Um, and now that you know, you know, mm -hmm. you can't tell anybody. It has to remain a secret. <laughs> please, please tell Keep anybody going. listening. I'm sure you'll be at a party soon, dear listener. And people will be puzzling about um, what happened to the Proto-Oceanic final consonants. And you'll say, well, actually, it's a conspiracy. Did so, you say, please tell anybody? I guess that works. Please tell anybody? Yeah, please tell anybody. <laughs> Positive anybody? Exactly. Let's go Let's go to the text now, finally. I cannot wait any longer. You are share screening, my friend. Yeah, okay. Okay, I guess I can go right over you. I'm going to go okay. right over you. All right. So... This oh, pardon me. Yay. <laughs> so let's try to do some more. Get Let's glean what we can before we put in the translation from two, three. And where are we in the story? We're just meeting the characters still. So someone is speaking down there about Mekania. Okay, I got to do this first. When we're looking at the story, I know this Va. 
Is it going to recognize it? No. I'm going to make it recognize that capital VA is the same as little VA. Right. It needs to right. be told. What about this LOTU? Do you recognize this? LOTU is one of our downward motion verbs, and it seems to have a transit. LOTU, uh, something like that. I'm going to say fall it. Drop, fall it. Then no, this G, we started noticing this problem yesterday. I have a proposed solution for now, like a solution. It's like a plan to make a plan, a solution until we find a solution. We'll figure out what person and number is going on, and we'll just call a bunch of these things subject. And once we've entered all the stories, we're going to come back and really try to tease apart what the pre-verbal subjects are. Once we have even a full set on one of them, mm -hmm. like say we get third singular, we get a real full set, then we'll have an idea what all the categories are and if there's any sound symbolism, and we'll be able to um, put together things a little bit better. Uh, so for now, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Now, Gore Ziu, do you remember Ziu? Ziu is first singular object. Uh, the first person object. hundred percent. We haven't seen Ziu in a while, not since the first story, but I'm glad this speaker's using it too. Mm -hmm. So what do you think Kumbokota means? I think it means either the place or the tribe, Kumbokota. I'm putting in Kumbokota. It's the name for itself. I'm going to call it a proper noun. Right, spelled with a B is going to be an mb sound. Kumbokota. Yeah, all right. So let's go back to gloss and see if we can guess any meanings from the sentence that we filled in some of the missing words. How do you not have a gloss for this? Flex, uh, figure it out. It does. The lexeme, lexical entry, and the word gloss entry are separate things. Yeah. Well, no, we don't have Gori Zhu either. It does It does not generate those because it hasn't seen that specific form. I'm going to call this descend to me. Yes, but I will insist that you spell the word correctly. How did I do this twice? I just deleted it. And... <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> the other oceanic conspiracy. All right, going back to gloss view, I'm looking at the sentence. The only thing I don't know is Gi. I suspect it's important, by the way. Ooh. Okay, so our context, uh, I think it'd be easy enough to read all the sentences we've got so far. This is the story of Tangi Tangi and Mekania. Tangi Tangi was a warrior from Nonotongere and Mekania a warrior from Nango. But Tangi Tangi had two names. The other one was Ruruhu. And so quickly the things heard about Mekania came to that warrior from Nonotongere. And he spoke down there about Mekania, that warrior from Nonotongere. So... Zara Veazai. So that's how mm -hmm. probably he speaks. So I'm guessing Gi is probably third singular. Another, Para, another one with an echo vowel, we think. Paranga, yeah, I believe. So that's how he spoke, Ruruhu. So um this is an intransitive use of speak. Right. right. Okay. He spoke. Ruru, 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 Ruru spoke. spoke. E here is marking an intransitive subject. Now to look at E and mechania is marking like a indirect object or something from ditransitive or something. So we're still curious about this E. What would I guess for the meaning here? So I'm guessing uh, it's Ruruhu who says cause fault. We don't know Pudu. But the speak come down to me. But he said, I am the warrior of Kumukota, said Ruru. Now, oh wait, Ruru who is the warrior from Nonotongare. Ruru who is the other name of Tangi Tangi. Tangi Tangi. All right, so I believe this is the correct sentence here. Long. Tangi tangi no no tongere. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. There it is. That's why the correct the the translation that's provided is that is why Ruruhu said lay the keels of war canoes because word has come to me about that warrior from. Ah, uh, that's why zaparanga there in the middle. That's the word. That's nominal. Ngiparanga in the top line. That is a verb. Somebody saying something. Somebody speaking. But then zaparanga, the word has come. 
Okay. Has come down to me. The Lord is you. Okay. So, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Seems you have a thought, Peter. I do have a thought. I'm having <laughs> some thoughts right now, in fact. <laughs> thinking so, all hard. We have only, I'm thinking all hard. We have only seen na, and we've been calling it our article. Right? Na varene, the warrior. Right. True. Although we've seen na used in cases that might also be not very definite. So what is the deal with na if it's not really carrying definiteness? Well, I propose to you it marks common nouns. Uh-huh. Okay. But one thing that's puzzled me from the beginning, and I don't know if you recall, I actually mistook za for something else early on. And that is because I quickly noticed this SZ correspondence with Roviana. Roviana uses sa all the time mm -hmm. as, their, as their common noun article. And they also use na as another type of common noun article. And I used to think the difference, difference was definiteness. So if you check my archive and my early descriptive work is archived there, full of typos and everything, but it exists. Please don't judge me if you go. Send me the typos <laughs> you think I should fix and the things I've done wrong in my analysis. That It's several years old. It's it's getting up there in age, so I don't necessarily agree today, but it exists for archive reasons. But you would see that I used to gloss it as deaf and in deaf, but I abandoned that. That's not what's mm -hmm. going on. But what the exact difference between sa and na in Roviana is, I couldn't figure out. But to say I was looking for sa in Gononga would be, it was what I expected. And at a certain time, I started thinking, ah, maybe they just use na. It's easier for me as an outsider to understand, so I wasn't complaining. Yet here, it would be very hard to not notice its word has come down and za doesn't seem to be any sort of agreement particle here. It is almost certainly some other type of article. I agree. And I don't, it's one of the reasons I don't want to approve throughout. Mm -hmm. We're going to run into this problem. Then we're going to have to go back and check everything, even things we may have already approved throughout. So I'm guessing Pudu is keel. Yeah. It occurs only in two sentences, this line and the next. Well, let's check. And keel is present in both. Yeah, I can easily. So I'm calling Pudu. I'm going to call keel. What, what is, is a keel, by the way? Ah, I was going to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> Please do. All right. When you look at a boat from the outside, or when a boat is in the water, it looks like it's just like a tub, right? Flat on the bottom. But that's not going to withstand wind and other conditions. So there's this part that descends into the water to stabilize the boat. Am I right? That is yeah, I was, I was thinking there's like a little... Even if the boat's not completely flat, there's something in there awesome stabilizing. Bitch there. I'm not a huge boat understander, so <laughs> if, yeah, if we've got slightly wrong, that's okay. We both seem to understand the keel is what stabilizes the boat in wind and waves, and yeah, it's, it's on the bottom protrude. of the boat, whether it's right. a little... A downward protrusion. They could be quite dramatic, like shark fins, but going downward. Some yeah, so like on sailboats, it's, it goes down pretty far. Um, and I've heard it said of many dugout canoes that they don't have a keel, and so they require great balance to use. So uh, a catamaran is another way to get around that problem. You just have two vessels strapped together. Catamaran? You mean oh. vodka. And I know you mean vodka. Yeah. Because the catamaran, does the catamaran have any uh, history before exposure to Polynesian double-hold canoes? Or was it just a renaming of Polynesian double hold canoes? I see, I see. Uh, cultural appropriation. Well, let's not get into those waters. Catamaran well, actually, now I want to know the etymology of catamaran. It's from the Tamil language, which I studied for a semester at Unity. Okay. Katamaram. One part means tree. It's like split tree or something, but I can't recall. I'm going to look it up. You can track historic movements of, or prehistoric or whatever it is, not based on writing, but thousands of years ago, movements of Austronesians by who was able to get the outrigger? Because the outrigger innovated once. That was with the Malayo Polynesians. Kertu to tie. So it's tie wood. Mudam is the tree or the wood. Tied trees. When did the word, do we know how old the word is? The Tamil word. Let's see. This one, this source doesn't usually give me the first attestation. Hold it up for you. Let's see how old it is in English, just for curiosity. Uh, I need to get into an OED for that. I'm just Googling my my confirmed result. Oh, you trigger. Inspired by Austronesian outrigger. Catamarans were invented by, by the Austronesian people. But not so cool. Why did they give it a Tamil name? 
I, I can guess that without looking, although I might be wrong, but just to speculate because I don't want to Google too much. So as I was telling you, one of the ways you can track these things is by the voyages of the Austronesians. And so one thing that you might be interested to know is that they have found things like cloves in ancient Roman ruins and things like that. So archaeologists know that cloves were traded thousands of years ago, even all the way into Rome. Right. Do the Romans grow cloves? No. Cloves and nutmeg only grew naturally one place in the world. Did you know that? Tyler? I did not know that. That's in the original East Indies. That's the reason people are trying to get there so hard. And they had been traded for thousands of years before Europeans tried to take over the trade. So one of the explanations, Malagasy, the language of Madagascar, comes from southeast Borneo, where there used to be a little bay and it filled in with wow. silk now. And it comes from southeast Borneo, but apparently they probably followed with the Malay traders all the way far to the route, Madagascar. Madagascar is probably a stop on the Austronesian trading route. Right? So the Austronesians sailed around India and the Indian Ocean for thousands of years. And this is not Oceanic Austronesian, this is Western Austronesian, uh, all Malayo Polynesian, certainly. So Malayo Polynesian is a primary subgroup of Austronesian. It makes up the majority of the languages. And so the Malay traders had been doing stuff there for a long time. I suspect, right, that catamaran may be a word from Tamil, but that the actual thing, they, yeah. didn't, take the, they didn't take the Austronesian word, but they saw that. It's like, that's a good idea. Yeah. You know what, Tyler? It is a good idea. It's a great idea. I don't want to capsize. Moving on from Kiel. Um, yeah. Oh, We've the... got to solve the za problem. Yes. And I think that there, you could argue it's a separate sense because it's a bit of a didactic thing. And you look at some of the Austronesian comparative stuff says, well, maybe this was <laughs> comes from a this, that type thing. Yes, yes. I propose we actually create an entirely new entry. What? All right. You're in charge. You're in the driver's seat with this flex business. And I'm going to frustratingly just call it art. Because I don't okay. know what the article does. I want an article too. There are times when it looks clearly like a third singular agreement marker, but in this case, it'd be hard to argue it's not an article. Um, and I think that this is a case of homophoning. What happened? What did it do to me? Yeah, it'll... Okay, that's, that's weird that it does that. It did it to me just... But no harm done. Flex was just overwhelmed with my change of heart there. So... Question. Yes. What is the part that means because? Because word has come to me about that warrior from Kumbakota. Where is the because-ness? It's Ura. Wow. Love it. I told you before that but isn't necessary, that it's going to be complicated. What lines up with an English conjunction won't necessarily line up with that conjunction. And that's my guess, Ura. Okay, let's, you want to fix it there? Make it say because in that instance? BC. I think it kind of has to be. That's the only word. Isn't there an archaic use of but in English that's like that? But word. for my best efforts or whatever. Yeah, it's like despite. It's like despite, yeah, but despite and because are uh, causes. <laughs> Something like that, potentially. I did a pun between cousins and cause because they both caught, so. Thank you for drawing my attention to it. I saw the slight smirk and I said, oh, Tyler got it and thought this was bad. But I need to make sure all the listeners knew how bad it was. Okay, we can change it for because here. I would, yeah. Let me read this Maybe we don't need to update the lexicon. I don't know. It seems like it'd be a more elemental. Lay the sense. keels of war canoes. I wonder if Pudu is only the keel of war canoes. Or it could be that it's general or for keel. But when you lay them, it's for one purpose. And that is war. Yeah, that may be understood in the context. Like you won't just lay the keels for anything. Also, you may not have to lay keels for dugout canoes as they may not have them. Now, it's, since we're talking about this, a small note on what I learned about boats in Roviana. I've told you already about the word vaca, meaning foreign things and probably coming from Polynesian, being used for planes, vaca, tapuru, tapuru, fly. Um, tie vaca, tie person, vaca, I presume foreign. So tie vaca is foreign person. But it means vo boat and it comes from Oceanic. Well, they have other words for boat. Um, they have Jore and Mola. 
And these were originally supposed to distinguish between uh, dugout canoes and sewn, sewn mm. canoes. If you're sewing canoes, what what is the material? Wood. So it doesn't mean sewn the way you would think of like a sewn skin canoe or something maybe from North America. Exactly, yeah. It's like the, the wood is fit together really cleanly like this and glued a little bit. So like, right. like this. Okay, okay. And um, the other one is Tomoko, supposedly coming from Toa Moko. Toa alive, Moko don't cry. Hush, Moko is a good oceanic word. And in any we case... An article about sewn boat. Hore and Mola are used, in my experience, a bit interchangeably. And again, that could be my error as a listener and learner. But the Tomoko is important, and it's very different from the other ones. And the Tomoko is the war canoe, and it's made with... It's not just as made with a bunch of different planks. The planks come from a bunch of different types of trees. It's it's a high technology, and you know it's good because a lot of people in the Western Solomons make it. Mm. It probably started somewhere, if you believe the Roviana story, as I do. It started with Teola, the Minate we were discussing last time, who taught them how to build it. Now, I was going to ask you, would, would culture hero be an apt descriptor for such a person? Cultural hero? Like the inventor of agriculture, somebody who has a really great idea that changes. They have they have cultural heroes too. Like there are people in the Vivine Malivi that are known characters and stuff. So Teola is a different. That'd be more like oh. if you're comparing it to Greek mythology. That'd be more like the what are the Titans came before the Greek got. It's more like a Titan. Okay. Anyways, since we're talking about boats and the catamarans and the outrigger canoes and all that, I want to. Why might they not include a word because it would be so understood in the environment? And because I know a little bit about it, we should share this. This is important. We talk about the outrigger, yet I have not discussed a single Rovi on a canoe that has an outrigger. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Why would outrigger be so good that pretty much everywhere in the world where people saw it, they're like, I'm going to do that too. Even make up a word for it. Right. Why? Well, one of the things is, is that if you're purely worried about speed, you want a longer, thinner boat. Look at like, um, they'll look at the kind of rowing they do uh, at a, uh, so Harvard, for example, has a rowing team. Yeah. And they will race Yale every year or whatever. And the boat is long and thin. Why? Because it's fast. Right? Al Rigger would, would be smashed by one of these racing rowboats in a short distance right but what is bad about a long thin boat is that you can get smashed on the open ocean pretty easily mm -hmm. what if head hunting by storming people's villages speed became so important that surviving the open ocean became almost irrelevant wow i'm pretty sure that's what happened uh and they took these boats over open ocean there's an area the uh, Solomon Islands has kind of like a double island chain and the air, the water between they call it the slot and it can be quite treacherous. Okay. And they would take the uh, war canoes over the open ocean to go raid Isabel and um, Choisel called Rauru in our text. And so I bet they said, lay the keels. Everybody knew what they were talking about instantly. Mm -hmm. And this probably doesn't even have a word. It's probably, that's why the war canoes thing is in parentheses. Yeah, yeah. Everybody would know that. Those are really helpful things for people like us, where we are not in the culture. If they just said lay the keels, because word, because word has come to me about that warrior, harder for us to figure out the meaning. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take a guess at the next sentence, if we can. Yes. Kongari valutua napuru. Kongari gurai. I think that's a new word. Kori nangeto. Have we seen nangeto? I know it. Okay, I know what it means. But you would but you know it from your other experience. I just know it because it's a cognate with Roviana. We get a nice we get a couple numerals here. Korai is two. Kori is two, but then Ari Kalima, and you know instantly what, what number that is. Lima is one of the most stable Austronesian words nice. there is. It is Lima number five. means number five. What do you think it can also mean in other languages, in some of these languages? Lima bean. No. Specific <laughs> hand or finger? Peru. No, it, yes, it means hand. <laughs> mm, right? The five. The five. Yeah. Five and hand are related concepts. I wonder if there's some point in the history of a language like English 
probably maybe even pre-Indo-European, that five and hand were the same word. That does not well, shock me. You ever notice that five and finger begin with the same sound? No. <laughs> no, it might not be pretty accident. obvious, but no, I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. So the Indo-European, you could reconstruct from comparing all the sister and cousin languages related to English, you can reconstruct how the word five must have been a couple of millennia ago. It was pinkwe. And if you added a suffix or two onto that, you could get penkwuros, which is where we would get finger from. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the word toe, I believe, is related to the number 10. That would make sense. We have 10 of each, but <laughs> the hands are more salient. So Well, and people don't start counting toes till they're over 10 anyways. So I don't, I sadly don't recall which language it was, but this is another Pete Lincoln anecdote. Pete Lincoln was telling me of a language um, in Melanesia where there was some sort of, because there's a lot of quinary systems in New Guinea. Quinary means a system of five in counting. So once you get to six, it's five plus one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've studied such a language. It was Ch uh, Chichewa spoken in Malawi has such a counting system. Extremely cool. And it isn't surprising that a lot of number systems are either five or ten. Yeah. Of, they attract our attention. They're really useful number systems. You're just checking them out. You're like, hey, this many. Even if you don't have words for five, you can be like, you can do a correspondence and be like, all right, well, there's this many. This, yeah, one hand's worth. Now, what's the Latin word, the Latin word for a finger, Peter? Dedo. In Portuguese, that's lost to G. Think of... If you had to you go to the, see the doctor for a finger inj injury, what fancy word is you going to use to describe where that injury is? Digit? Is it what you're looking yeah. for? And doesn't that look a lot like the numeral 10? Yeah, I agree. Let me tell oh. you what Pete Lincoln told me, just this little anecdote. Mm, sorry. Was that he was talking about some language where their word um, for six and seven and such had some sort of thing for like other hand. So like other hand one might be six. I might be slightly misrepresenting this. We we should talk to Pete one day if he'd agreed to be on yeah. our uh, show here. And he would be many, many anecdotes. Of course, I've heard most of them several times. I would just love to hear them many more times if I could. And get them for posterity. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the you know, there's not that many people so passionate about oceanic linguistics. So you got to be friends with whoever it is. No matter what other drawbacks. No, you me. don't have to. I, I'm being. I would love to be friends with Pete Lincoln, even if I didn't study oceanic linguistics. He's a delightful person, in my opinion. All right, and I'm so glad he's made his name is being referenced on the podcast. He he will enjoy this. I'll let him know. All right, so I have an idea about the meaning of ghetto, and that's going to help me with my guess. Tyler, have you already spoiled it and taken a guess? I Look, have not. I'm going to tell you. I this is our first instance of the word. I recognize some words. I recognize ghetto. Oh, wait. I do recall now from looking at this a week or two ago. And I, I think I it's going to be some sort of cultural artifact. I don't agree. Okay. I, I recognize ghetto. I recognize Lima. I recognize Ngavolu. I recognize Panda. Uh, panda. Panda. There is no word uh, that is unglossed here that I do not recognize. My cool. Answer. That's a cool situation to be in. I'm glad we're doing it this way so that we can... Let's see benefit. if I can guess any of this and we'll see how good my real guessing is. So let me spoil it. I believe ghetto is group. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. So... Group of two. A group. That group of two. The five Navulu. That could be an echo vowel at the end. Navul. Um... I can't reveal too much more about my knowledge of ghetto because you could understand there are secret groups. And so I understand how the syntax works, but I can only think of an example of a secret group. So I can't talk about it. I see. Lima is five. Guess on Navalu. Is that one a boat word? It's a counter for 10. So Lima Navalu is 50. There we go. Whoa. 50 oh, cool. person. So the get, the group, the group was a 50 person group. What do you think Panda means? Is this intentionally reduplicated? We get. Ah, should it be that way? That's a great question. I have it open here. Well, don't spoil it now. Okay, so this is the, the one beginning with Kongari. Kongari. Tinoni, Pandana, 
Makangeto Lima Ngabulu Pandana Makangeto. It is reduplicated in the original. It just kind of says it twice. Okay. What does Panda mean? So we think, you probably think Na is a possessive, possessive marker. I agree with you. What do <laughs> I think Panda means? Their leader? I believe it means measure. Measure. Okay. So group measuring 50, pe 50 people. Now we've got Tinoni as man before, and we looked at the ACD, it suggested that man is a somewhat common actual meaning for it, not just person. Hmm. So Tinoni might be a 50 man group, a group measuring 50 men. Okay, yep. Hurai, I think is unknown though. What's that? That G U R A I, end of the first line in that sentence. We only have two instances of it. All right, so Gura is the verb in my guess. And E is Reflect a plural e. object, third plural. plural object. So I'm guessing it was they, I don't know, divided in two groups. Korinagetu. Uh, gr two groups of 50 each, basically. That's mm. my guess. Shall we look at the... Yes, we, sh uh, we shall. Oh. Now, in this segment of the translation, there is a problem. It doesn't seem to align too well. So I have merged these two cells because it's not clear exactly, not clear to me exactly how these correspond. I think some bit of the original sentences are left out. All right, I'm going to put the first thing in here and we'll see how we split it up. It's, yeah. Uh, and my guess on 50 was pretty good. Yep. Pretty darn good, each for 50 men. So the two held a hundred of Ruruhu's tribe. That I think I guess after the word so, yeah, that's gonna be the next line, Eoko Koringeto. I think we can pretty confidently cut it there, or we can wait. So okay. just that reduplicated part is left out. It's like each 50 men and each 50. This one 50 men and this one 50 men. They've collapsed it in the English. I have a guess here on Gogoto as well. Go to it. 100. Pandandi, mm. they measured instead of it measured. Pandandi, yeah. The D refers to plural possessors. The Na refers to singular possessors. Kulindi, we've seen. Now we get Burai again. Right. Um, I rianam buntu, 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 T. T is a new word, I think. T I, immediately, I immediately recognize this, though. I think it, it's either related to or incorporates that person marker E. Could be ta and e fused. I agree with that. Okay. Oh, I agree. Ta e fused. Why did I never think of that? Of course, that's what it is. <laughs> Lucky I knew I'm the meaning of it, but I never thought of it that way in Roviana hmm. because I was too influenced by Portuguese. Gotta cut that out. So in Roviana, this is te. Ooh. Letter e. So we've seen this ei correspondence with the person marker, which is a letter e in Roviana. And yeah. we know that ta from tana, tandi, and stuff has something to do with possession. So ta e becoming t makes sense. One of the reasons is t a e in Roviana, tai, is the very crude word for feces. I see homophone avoidance, taboo avoidance. There's a well, and we already don't like two vowels touching for other reasons if they're derived. So there's a lot of reasons for it, I would be guessing, but t is. When I saw te and Roviana, it's only used for persons. That's correct. But it has a very similar meaning to Spanish or Portuguese de. De. Mm -hmm. You could think of it. So it's of personal. Of it's the lesser used third style of possession. Okay. And there I we go. So we finally saw it. Let me start entering some of these words and we'll see if we can slice up these this uh, translation a little bit. Magnificent. Group. And that's a big cheat because you would not have guessed that from this translation. Perhaps not. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It doesn't use a word for group. I should have let you guess on the translation before I spoiled it, but I really wanted to share my Roviana knowledge here. I did it hands-free. I don't secretly have a dictionary in front of me. I just remembered it. Peter traveled halfway around the world and remembered a word. I remembered several words. One of them was Lima. Now, the thing is, if you said, say 50 in Roviana, I wouldn't have remembered it's Lima Navalu. But as soon as I saw it, I remembered. Right. I mean, I remembered Lima, but the 10 thing, there's a different marker for 10 and then orders of 10 uh, in Roviana anyways. 
they're decads, yeah. Just like in English, 10 versus the T suffix in 50. Do you think that's an accident? Those begin with the same sound? Um, I've actually uh, regularized my entire counting pattern, and that's why I say 1T and 2T and 3T. Oh, I say 13. You could say 10. I say 1T. That's what I say. 1T. 1T, 2T, then 13. Definitely logical. At least my 11 through 19 makes sense again. All right. I'm going to create a new entry. Five, and I believe we already have used cardinal number as a thing. We only have numeral. So I'm just numeral. Navalu, this is 10, but it's really not 10. It's like. You could, you could gloss it as X10 10, 10 times or as decad or something. D E C A D. Or we could put it as 10 and then put it in the definition that it's. So many things we can do. Yeah, multiples of 10. I don't want to say decade because I'm going to think it's 10 years. Not decade, but a decad is defined as a group of 10 notes from which the consonant triads may be constructed, aren't you? Okay, so not quite the word we want. Multiple 10. We could I just gloss it as dash ten. ty, I suppose. I thought about using ty. Mm-hmm. But it might not be that clear. I think I'm going to call it 10 and then. Or how about this? We call it tens to distinguish it from the cardinal. I love that. All right. And I'm still going to actually go to the. You want to call it a numeral? It might not be. <laughs> it's numeroid. It's numeral-ish. Yeah, let's call it that. I'm going to call it a numeral because we're, we're, it's probably not the cardinal number, but it's used in cardinal numbers. Yeah, it's, it's a numeral-ish. So used to form multiples of 10. Indicate or form, that's what I want to say. Form multiples of 10 or... Now, EG, do you do E dot G? Yes. E dot G. B gratia. Lima Navulu. Navulu, I don't have a special character. Yeah, Only that's fine. Things. Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to figure that out when we see it again. All right, make sure it's still giving me U.S. Okay. All right. Now, panda, I believe, means measure. And I just know from Roviana. Measure. Okay. So that's a bit of a cheat. Measuring 50 persons. It's measured. So the noun sense of measure, its measure was 50 persons. Let's see what it is in Roviana, and we'll, we'll make sure. Mm -hmm. Way. E, panda, yeah. You get a sequence of three vowels. Panda, na, way on fishing well, you remember there's a, there's two pressures here. One is that it's only a two-syllable word with no final coda. And the other one is you can't have panda. You can't have the double ah sequence. So it's one of the places where it preserves a three-vowel sequence. Right. It's the only way to... You have to avoid the high... If you were an optimality person, you would say that long vowel is worse than vowel sequence. <laughs> so here we see, it seems, a divergence of how Hanonga and Roviana handle this. I think in... I don't go, that kind of sequence would come out as pandai. You drop the final R. Or that E is a different suffix. No, I think because E is going to be third, probably going to be the third plural object agreement, that Good. they will probably do the exact same thing in, in Ganonga. Or this I might mean, be a case where they would use, um, they might have another solution. But... Well, not... I always think it's best when Peter and I disagree. Well, then we can really check something out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that motivates us to, to find the response. But it's also really cool when we agree. So really, it's win-win. Let's see um, which other uses of panda we get. So there we get it in sound. This is of water. You understand, like a, a sound. Ah, it's like the Puget sound. Okay. And like the Puget sound. So there you get panda ya colo, colo meaning water. Whatever. Scale, you get panda by itself. Cool. Scales of fish, capuigana. Yeah, Ikan. scales. I oh, ikan. Igana, and the Hawaiian word for fish is ia. That's right. And we already talked about this. We talked uh, about it. It's yeah. been a while. That it's not a, it's probably a species. Mm, when we were talking about that bonito shoal. And the that is what we That's right. Reckon, panda ia, how I measure it. How measuring it. 
practice, pandarak, unrelated, I believe, measure, pandaya, pandana. So you're getting measure, weight, scales. Good stuff. Weigh, weigh the two options, right? Well, you're not <laughs> going to actually weigh them. I, I, I believe reckon, measure, this kind of Very thing. Good. That's right. Limit. Yeah, yeah. Measure, reckon is such a great word. Far, well, under, scandalously underused. We know, I use it in my English whenever I can. We know that vadi is distributed. Yes. yes. Vadi pandani. Now, how does it, vadi is not a single morpheme, right? It's. It is. V, well, it's, no. No, it's V with an R infixed, or how does it work? It could. So I look at it as a single morpheme currently, but one way you could okay. look at it is, and I don't know if this is what Bob Lust would agree or whatever, but that you get the causative va plus plural. So okay. Plural is distributed. It could be, but this could be also the I Laos. I mean, it just looks yeah, like yeah. it could be not that case. <laughs> and for those of you who didn't catch that explanation uh, several episodes back, that was where we were misled by the structure of a word. Matahutu looks like I plus Laos, meaning fear, but it just happens to look that way. That came you... from historic form mataku. All right, here we get an echo vowel right here, uh, uh, vowel and loan word. So for Christ, you get caricito. I wonder why they capitalized that one and cockroach on this page. Because they're loans? Is that the idea? Cockroach, where is that? Uh, right side, fifth, fifth side. Cocoro. Maybe they're loan words. They have that well, special. They're completely capitalizing loan words. Mm -hmm. Not bad. It's good to good to set those apart so that people. Will know. I believe the calculate pandaya. So the calculate is a really good one because it's clearly clearly a noun or a, a excuse me a verb. Yeah, verb. Um, wait, yeah, I can you go I back think... to the previous one? Wait, wait, wait. Go back to where we were just. There was a really cool. Yeah, Same. yeah. Look at the word carpenter on the right side. Right side, I, saini is cool. Look at how Carpenter comes out. Would not have suspected that. Commander? Commanda. I guess it could be. It's or, or... 100% my, my. Right. Okay. So like in in Hawaii, you can still hear people say sometimes like Kapena. Means captain. Okay. Yeah, so there there is definitely it's an important word. You understand the history of people and them not being so nice and things like this. Uh, okay, let's look and see if we got any more words to get here. Now it should recognize panda, yep. imme right. panda immediately. We'll see that it does. You need to approve it. Okay, there, there it goes. Don't even need to approve. It's already hypothesized. It'll take a guess. Now, at some point, we're gonna have to go through all of our stories and uh, approve each one. But we want to wait till we know all the difference between the za, for example. All right. So this one looks pretty good. This one down here, ao probably coming from ego, which is a so discourse article type word. What do you think gogoto means? Geto arimaka gogoto tinoni pandandi gari gurai riana butbut tiruru. Two groups. Now we did just see the translation. I'm going to try not to look. Look at the translation because this is one translation for two sentences. Arimaka Okay, Rogoto is going to be 100. I think you already said it also. Yeah. I believe it's like this. Two groups of 50, so it's one group of 100. Two held 100 of Ruruhu's tribe. I'm struggling to envision a canoe that can hold 50 people. That sounds huge. It is a big what, Do you know any ancestral forms of this numeral in the Go proto languages? Of Gogoto? Mm hmm. Uh, let's check ACD right quick. Yeah, don't want to take us down too many rabbit holes, but it's such a cool, cool. No such thing is seems like a fun words. word to me. Hmm? No such thing as too many rabbit hole rabbit holes. All right, so let's use. <laughs> I, the I was thinking on this one the, for the, the amount of rabbit holes we go go down, we really should call it a Warren. <laughs> We're falling into the Warren. Warren is probably one not everybody knows. We talked about. It. We did okay. Many many episodes back, yes. They have ratus for hung hundred. That's kind of what I thought. Ratus, okay. Okay, let me uh, let me check something real quick. I will allow it. I cannot prevent it. Try as though you might. Yep. <laughs> Use my Jedi mind power, maybe. Peter is about thirty miles from where I sit. So I have these 
three of the five volumes. I have one, two, and four of the Lexicon of Proto Oceanic. Nice. I worry that it's four or five, which has the numbers. I think mm-hmm. I'm gonna check material culture right quick and see if somehow numbers are part of material culture. I doubt it. Why are you doing that? This AO intrigues me again. I think we see the. F- We've said it's a variant of AO. We only have two. Wait, what's going on? Why? Huh? Okay, AO, just two instances in this text. So let me look for EGO, AGO. Yeah, in later on in this text, meaning A, to say now it's your turn, just to sort of, what's the word? Uh, something you speak aloud that has no meaning. Interjection, that's the word I'm looking for. Ego, we do have it where it's something like, so be it. That's interesting. So be it twice. So much interesting stuff, but I fear that we don't get... This, this AO is some kind of discourse marker, it seems. AO or AGO. Now I the think origin. it's kind of like English, so. Mm-hmm. Ego, co. And so now. Yeah. Ego, probably know AGO and co are... Oh, they can you... The same proto oceanic word and one was in reintroduced or whatever. Peter, can you up a little bit? Uh, no, I'm flex. Uh, so, each for 50 men. Can you grab that so in the free translation? 3-1. Three, 3-1. One. Three, one. Last word. No, no. Last word in the free translation. And put the, put it in 3.2, please. Oh. That's where it belongs. It's the AO. AO call. We have two so's. Two different so's. So the two... Gogoto Arimaka Gogoto Gogoto. I wonder where the stress is. It would be really is cool if ago? no. No, that's some kind of so discoursey. So now, something like that. It's often done as now. Did we ever get a guess on Gurai? Uh, only is here in this stretch. Let's see. Is it the war canoe? Here, war canoes is there in the free translation. It's not bracketed. So it seems to suggest that there is a word meaning war canoe. And this would be the best candidate, I think. Well. Or it's a verb because it has ngadi right before it. It has ngadi right before it. It's a verb. Times. They, oh, it's, it's going to be hold then. I think it's contain. hold or mm-hmm. they seat or something like this. Let's say contain for now. Yeah. And I don't actually think we have seen E before as an object agreement. Is that correct? Well, <laughs> I'll so find out. I'm going to do AI space search for that. There are words ending in I. They're a bit rare and they always sort of pique my interest. So I'm going to do I'm a search for search. Tonai. Tonai. Kozana, Kotonainge, Kamuria. There's a hundred. Verb. Yeah. That's right. The 42. That's the set I'm looking at, too. Let's look together. So this 3 3 is where we are now. Let's go upward, though, to see stuff we've that seen is. before. Yeah. Where's our IE here? Tonai. Tonai. Saw the reason for catching all the. That is the way they saw the reason for catching all the bonito. So when the Choisel people got there, they would kill all the Maluku. Raven I. Pondalai. Pa Pondala. With a pa proceeding looks like a noun. Navagato. Or is it the hearing one? Did we let's go to that in the text? Well, Pondalai exists in Roviano too, and they felt spell that final I with an E. Where'd you say you want to go? Uh, let's go into the text for the uh, the flex text, paragraph six of Mutu Mutu. I was thinking at some point, maybe we don't need to do it now, but at some point it'll be helpful to add numerals to the titles so we can. If it ever starts to get confusing, that's just an easy way to avoid confusion. 
paragraph six, uh, the very last line of six. There's seven Anatutindi. They followed them to Turu Gehua. Pondai, we said Pondalai begin. So the beginning. Seems unlikely to me that Pondalai is the whole no. verb. No, Pondalai. Um, uh, oh, I, it's like I said, I believe it's cognate with Roviana, and this is an IE correspondence. Roviana also has an an I ending for third plural objects, right? We just aren't seeing, we haven't had many chances to see it yet in this language. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually one of the problems is just getting all of your information from text. Yeah, that's true. There was the Pondalai that showed clearly it means beginning. Yeah, I, I here is Totonai. <laughs> what do we say Tonai is? Right. I'm going to go to my concordance. I'm going to look for tonai. When I I believe it means when or then. We get it in both meanings. Yeah, so I don't think it's an object agreement situation. Yeah, in that case, it is not. You mean generally, but or in this specific word? In this specific word, I don't think it's. Okay, okay, yeah, I don't think so either. This could be a diphthong. It's worth considering that I is a single syllable in these instances. I agree with that, and that's what I think it is in those instances. And I think for vi, but agreeing with me, which has kill, I think it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Good. Vi. Okay. Although vi kill plural, but that would actually could be a yeah. Vi zio, we saw kill me. Vi zio. Yes, we know that vi is its own root. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. This is a wonderful layout there. Hey, and we never saw. Oh, Oh, we yes. haven't started the story yet. Yeah, I think we're going to get a lot more E as we go in the story. Here we get it with two, at least two other words we haven't seen yet and we don't know yet. Yeah, I think we're going to have to go back to continue. We're going to have to leave Gurai for now mm. and not be so certain. Oh, no, I'm totally lost. I need to be here. Uh, Behind the monitor. All right, I'm going to go ahead and actually put these together. I will stop being so bold. <laughs> Boldness has left us. Yeah, you just replace it there. Urai, kori nangeto, kori nangeto arika lima na bulu tinoni bandana maka geto. The phrase structures are a bit elusive to me. Maka geto lima na bulu bandana maka geto. I think Gurai, we need to just leave it for now. Now, pandandi, we can actually do. Wait, we said that's the word for contain, right? Let's just give it a word gloss, but not put it in the lexicon. Two held, each for 50 men. Yeah, thank you. And then in three, two, yeah, it's already predicting. So this eo, ego, I would want to call the one with G the basic form. Agree. Let me uh, well, finish with this. being pandandi. deleted, then that it's, yeah. More right. likely that the gamma is being deleted than that it's being inserted. Sometimes things do get inserted, though. So be prepared to see that. I feel like it was taught to me in Roviana as ego, but then I noticed people were saying ao sometimes. So I think that ego is the they likely share this as a common retention. So or, oh, wow. we can go to our concordance and look for ego. Search. Right. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to find it. I'm actually going to leave it there. I'm going to go to analyze. The bulk of them are in this third text. Yeah. And I'm going to call this so. That's I realize we already have three so's. Call it is, so, let's call it so now, maybe, just to set it apart would be my suggestion. Matters little. Well, so now is different than so. And we do get it often as now in our texts. Okay. Not not meaning this instant, but let's add a dot. Right, Thank you. Dot. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to go back to the regular interlinear text. Uh, I'm going to go to gloss so I can find my place right quickly. And I'm going to go to AO, click on it, go back to analyze. And I'm going to say this is a variant of... 
Yeah. Beautiful. And not, okay, this is more. yeah. Just a variant. T we still haven't entered. But it's kind of like of dot PRS. Yeah. Very All right, so today we got through three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done our well, best. And I, we, I am we, we said some good words about the phoneme inventory, I think, and the syllable canon. And most importantly, we discussed the oceanic conspiracy. So, uh, and we managed to mention Hadge Ross and Pete Lincoln. So, a pretty Peace good episode Lincoln. overall. I am so excited to keep working on this. Um, that I, I very much look forward to finishing this story and working on the next ones. Uh, but until we get there, dear listener slash viewer, I will see you next time. Peace out.